Welcome to Building Sustainability Podcast with me, your host, Jeffrey Hart, aka Jeffrey the Natural Builder. Every fortnight, join me as I talk to designers, builders, makers, dreamers, and doers, exploring the wide world of sustainability in the built environment by talking to wonderful people who are doing excellent things. Hello, and welcome to episode 99. This episode is with Peter Kovach, a tool maker and product designer. Uh, it has taken a little while to uh, produce this episode. Uh, I think episode 100, I felt like it wanted to be a special one. So I've been focusing on that. And I kind of let episode 99 uh, fall away. And there's been a few cancellations and I've been busy and blah, 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 blah. Uh, all my excuses. Anyway, you don't need to know all that. This is episode 99. We've got a few more recorded in the bank, so um, expect a little steady trickle of, of podcasts over the next few months. Thank you, everyone, for being so patient, uh, especially all of the patron supporters, uh, because yeah, your support throughout this time has been incredibly gratefully received. Um, right, what to say about this episode? Um, it's a field recording. I've actually been up to Yorkshire to hang out with Peter in his workshop, his beautiful, beautiful workshop. So there are dogs and there were various little introductions. At one point, Peter's mum popped in. Uh, I've edited that out. So there's a few slightly clunky uh, edits. Um, I don't think it affects the uh, the content too much. This is actually the second attempt at recording this. Uh, I sat Peter down. We actually had just a beautiful moment where we sat in a sauna in at a green woodworking festival and we opened a cider and we recorded an hour's worth of conversation and then i looked at the recorder and it had only recorded the first four minutes oh my goodness devastated i think every podcast has probably got a story like that so i now record backups and all the other things that i've read about and thought nah won't happen to me does happen um so yes peter was very very kind and let me come back and record the chat a few weeks later i think enough time had passed that it felt fresh again and we kind of talked about things in quite a different order and focused actually on quite quite different things this time around um so i think it's actually better for it silver lining and all that um, we talk in this episode about the Heritage Craft Red List, which has just been released for 2023. Uh, this is the UK Heritage Craft Association. Uh, they do a study of which crafts are endangered or critically endangered. Uh, some go extinct. Um, bowl turning was a, I think it was critically endangered a few years back, and now it is off the endangered list thanks to... Uh, events like the bowl gathering uh, in Herefordshire or Northern Bowl up in Durham and just the the loads and loads of people who are putting in all the work uh, to teach and, and share knowledge and, and sort of make sure that craft doesn't disappear. And in fact, it is thriving. So um, do check out the uh, Heritage Craft Red List. I will put a link in the show notes uh what else to say uh i've oh that's what i have to say um i've actually redacted a bit i've beeped out the name of a maker of axes that we were talking about and they're a small maker and they make very very good axe that i've been using for years and i didn't want it to come across like i was talking negatively about them uh we're sort of discussing design um yeah i don't think no there were no sort of harsh comments but i just didn't want to i didn't want to be catty or anything like that uh so yeah redacted beeped out their name so yeah look forward to to some beeps um what else to say so we have a few new patrons to thank and they are maria lena hedberg ward thank you very much for your support Per Erling Waller. Is that how you say that name? I've got no idea. Uh, I'm very sorry if I've butchered your name. I believe you're Norwegian. Thank you so much for the support. You will be getting a spoon, a hand-carved spoon soon. Uh, Gracie, thank you so much for your support. Also getting a spoon. And Ben Walker, you have increased your amount. 
per month. Uh, that is incredible. Thank you, Ben. Really, really appreciate that. Um, and finally, Richard Barwick, thank you so much for your support. You can join these wonderful people in supporting the podcast by heading to patreon.com forward slash building sustainability. There's a link in the show notes. If you support by five pounds or more per month, then I will carve you a eating spoon or actually I've got some bowls and maybe some plates that I've uh, I've been turning recently on the lathe. Uh, you can choose one of those if you like. Yeah, there's there's a whole load of uh, bonus content on the Patreon site, uh, including about another 15 minutes from this conversation. Uh, so if you like the way Peter talks, then head on over there. Um, and a quick note just to say that anyone who has increased their their support to the five pound level and so is expecting a spoon from me uh it's very hard to keep track in the patron software uh of people that increase but don't change the plan uh so there's a one plan for for any amount and one plan for sort of five pounds and up and if you just stay on the any amount but put it up to five pounds then it's hard for me to know that you need a spoon so if you are expecting a spoon and you haven't got one yet then please send me an email or send me a message through patreon uh let me know and i will get something out to you as soon as possible and uh apologies uh i've yeah it's, it's hard <laughs> um that is it from me i'm back briefly at the end thank you very much for your patience i do think that episode 99 was worth the wait in all the ways enjoy <laughs> My name is Peter, Peter Kovac. I'm from Hungary. I've been living in the UK for well, 13 years, so since 2010. Uh, and I make tools for people, mainly carving axes and carving knives. Well, I mean, yeah, I think, yeah, that's what I do for a living at the moment. Yeah. But I do green woodworking as well on the side. I do leather work. Uh, I'm a trained furniture maker and designer. So what I do at the moment is trying to make a living from doing my craft, which is, <laughs> which is quite a, a tricky thing to do in this current climate, as you might imagine. Mm. So I think the reason I wanted to talk to you, or one of the many reasons I wanted to talk to you, was uh, because I came from a <laughs> growly dog. Um, I came from a product design background. And I know that's what you studied. Was it product design or furniture design? <laughs> product and furniture design, so yeah. And where was that you studied? In London, in Kingston. Ah, nice. I know Kingston a little bit. Oceana. Is that the name of the terrible nightclub in Kingston? I heard about it, but I yes. was uh, I was a mature student, so I never went to a party. In, <sighs> well, you know. well don't know. I feel silly now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I only went there once and it was all yeah. But also, I was, I was too old to have a pregnant wife at the time, so it's no Fair going enough. out partying. It was, wasn't in, in the books. Um, <laughs> but um, I think having spoken to you about your sort of product design, it's sort of all the things that I sort of wish I'd done. And I went straight into uni from school. Uh, I sort of didn't know anything didn't know anything that I liked what I was into all I knew is I liked making things and if I sort of look back on all the things that I did at uni it's like I I feel like there wasn't really much substance behind any of it mm. and well I mean we're going to talk about your the the trug project yeah um but that just sort of epitomizes everything that where I sort of have found myself. Mm. Um, so I guess it felt like uh, talking to you might... Uh, what's, what am I trying to say? Just it might, maybe it would make me like live the life I wanted to live yeah. well, <laughs> vicariously through you. But, well, I think, I think what you just said is that you felt like there's no substance behind it, that when you, when you do a course like that and you don't have... A, a purpose you know when you don't have a, a driving force behind you it, it's it's kind of you know like a ship 
doesn't know which which harbor to go to. So any wind comes, it's going to blow it in a certain direction. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, without purpose, it's really hard as a maker, as a designer, as a you know a creative person. Without a purpose, it's really hard to to feel put meaning behind these things, the experiences. Because the creative person, then you know you just you just oh this this oh look at that that's bright colors or you know you just get all over the place. And for me, what I was really great for me is to go there with the sole purpose of, of well, it's not true because I went there with, for the wrong reason. I went there to, to prove to myself mm. that I'm, I'm good enough, that, I'm, that I have a piece of paper that I can do this really well. Yeah. So because, you know, my journey started a lot earlier. So when I was nine back in Hungary, we started to do these um, summer camps uh, in Hungary, which was a lot of uh, crafting uh involved in that and it was it was all wrapped up in a, um in like a native american thing mm -hmm. so it's for kids it's really easy digestible that you you are part of a tribe and this within this tribe we we do let's say if you want a basic introduction to woodwork that you make a little axe so you go into the woods we, we harvest a bit of a hazel rod find a axe head shaped stone in the in the stream and then put the two together carve it uh, and they do leather work, they do clay work, they do all sorts of things. And from that point, I wanted to work with, with wood. So I went into a, a woodworking secondary school, uh, and then I did a, a furniture maker qualification. And then after that, I came to England and then worked here in several jobs, like the nearest furniture maker, cabinet maker. But I wanted more. And then when I was, I think I was 30, yeah, I was 30 and I went to uni mm -hmm. i finished uni when i was 30 so i went in there when i was 28 with the purpose of i want to prove it to everyone and to these really well uh, established designers and makers that i'm as good as as anyone else so when going to uni and you know all these 19 20 years old kids and as you probably like yourself like just didn't know what they want to do they mm. like making so some of them really flourished and i really flourished because that was the last time I felt like that I could just explore and make without any constraints, without any limits uh, in terms of, you know, because now I make a living from it. So every time I carve a spoon, every time I use a spoke shave on an axe handle, I look at the time, I look at how can I be more efficient, how can I be more productive. So for me, it was it was a great opportunity to learn who am I as a maker. Mm -hmm. And that was the biggest difference between a university course in, back in Hungary and in England, well, that specific one, because they didn't really give you guidance. They didn't really tell you how to do things. They said, okay, this is the brief. You go in there, you experiment for a, a month and come back and have a chat, see where you are at. So this is, if you are have a purpose, if you have a vision, then you can just discover how you operate. Do you your brain, how does your brain work, how you get from A to B. Do you need to do lots of sketches to think? Do you have to make actual physical models to think in three dimension? Like in your head, maybe you got it 3D, but put it down into a, a real space and how the proportions work, how the ergonomics works of certain projects. So for me, it was a really fantastic opportunity to just play, just explore and realize that what makes me tick in a way. So from that experience is, you know, I use it every day in a way that, you know, this really analytical mind I have of how things work and why they do the things they do. It's just really reinforced it that, yeah, that's the way, prototyping. And one of the biggest takeaways is just be brutally, brutally honest about your work. Like, don't trying to make it, oh, it's okay, oh, it's nice, or, oh, if I look it from this angle, it reflects the, the view of the Yorkshire Dales and, you know, all this kind of thing. It's just... just does it do what it intended to do? Is it honest? Did you are trying to fit something else that it doesn't fit this project? And um, and this my final project that you mentioned, the, the truck project, that was a really like a, a crown jewel of this whole process as well. It really put everything into place to to all the processes and all the work I did to look at it as as it working. Is it does it do the things I need to needed to do? And, uh, and ultimately enjoy the process. We'll be back after a quick break. If you're looking for all things BMX racing, you found the right podcast. 
Here at Lane 8 BMX Podcast, I'll speak to the local racer, the national racer, and even the Olympic level racer. I'm talking kids to the weekend warriors and much more. So get comfortable, turn up the volume, and remember to snap on green. Um, do you want to talk a little bit more about the, the trunk? Yes, yeah. So, um, yeah. Well, first of all, do you want to explain what a, what a trug is? So a trug, so specifically these, these one called the Sussex trugs, so they're mainly made in Sussex area. So a trug is, it's, um, it's a wooden basket made from a, a very thin um, slat or willow. Uh, have a hazel frame, so a steam band hazel frame, and to this frame you you uh, pin with a with a copper or brass, no, that's probably copper nails, this uh, willow slat, and it's a really lightweight but really strong structure. And the willow slats they don't need to be steamed; you just soak in water and you can really bend it. And um, what what's started this project for me is the the state of heritage crafts in, in England. So the heritage crafts in England, there's some, some endangered heritage crafts which probably will go out of of business in a way that no one will do it anymore in the next 10 years. And making a, the trunk making was one of them. And the, I wanted to investigate why why are these products, and why are these crafts becoming relevant, kind of, or obsolete for us these days. And because of the product itself become obsolete is became not usable for our lifestyle, not compatible with our lifestyle. And uh, But the problem is that most of the heritage crafts that are existent and was back in, in the days, they all work with the environment they were in. They use the materials available for to them. And this, uh, this again, the brutal honesty is, is what these materials are good for. So they had willow growing all, along all the stream and all the backs and um, so abundant that they grow quite quickly. So obviously you got the the basket making of the just a willow. The thin branch is really well established, but the actual trunk itself, what could it be used for? And uh, my aim was to to first investigate the process, investigate the materials, how they behave, and learn because every all of these crafts they have an immense knowledge of the, the how the material behaves, what is it good for, how to manipulate it to to set to serve a purpose, and when these crafts dying off but they disappear then all this material knowledge disappears with it mm-hmm. so how i wanted to my aim was to go in learn as much as i can and try to save the material knowledge and the processes and put it into a contemporary furniture uh thus preserving it and this was meant to do with the many other crafts as well but kind of stopped here but um i think it was really really successful so i went to sussex i learned i made the truck uh, and it was it was fantastic experience. So the the willow came from cricket bat manufacturing, so with all the offcuts. Um, so it's like a waste product in a way, and they were using it to make drugs. And uh, and after the question was, how do I put this willow slats into something useful for for us for the contemporary furniture? And there's most product and furniture designers in making a chair, obviously. So I want trying to screw these pieces of willow into a metal frame and just try to fix it together somehow. And this was about exactly the, what I was talking earlier, that being brutally honest, like, are you using the material in a way that is actually served the purpose? Is it actually does the thing? Or are you just trying to force it into submission of, of oh, the willow, which is really thin and flexible to a rigid metal frame, how is that going to work out? And and during this process, it took me about three, four months, three months, and I realized just, 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 just step back, look at what it's all about, how it behaves, how they fixed into a steam and hazel frame. So so after a long process of, of designing a chair and designing all the fixings, I created the the willow chair. So using uh, similar fixtures and and. Um, and having a metal frame that's just for the legs, but the, the structure itself, the, the curves of the chair, uh, it's very much reminiscent of a, of a Sussex truck and using the, this willow slats, which is really flexible, really bendy. And um, it just I came out really, really well. I was really, I'm really proud of it, I have to admit. It's one of the few works in my life that I'm really proud of. And obviously not perfect, because, um, because uh, first prototypes are never perfect, truly. But... Um, it's something that that I think 
it's a way forward could be a way forward for most of us if you if you just look around in your environment and look around what's available and there's probably obviously right down your alley of of, uh, of earth floors and all the other natural materials used to build your houses and and i think if if we not necessarily make trucks not necessarily you know make the houses exactly how they were made 200 years ago but plucking out the materials and the knowledge and the processes and put into a contemporary environment and, and usage i think this this would be a definitely a way forward for us to create a more sustainable life definitely so um oh creaky chair <clears throat> um so i just did a a talk at uh ye, not nu uh newcastle no northumbria oh yeah and i didn't know what to talk about so i just kind of looked at all the things i've done and I tried to sort of distill it down into like, what is that? Like, how has it shaped me? And what is it actually is it that I try and do? And that exact thing of looking at heritage and then sort of reshaping it is sort of where I got to. And I was, you know, thinking about natural materials and how they've been used for eons. And, you know, people knew the right materials to use in the right place and all this kind of thing. Um, then the example I ended up, or well, one of the examples I used in this presentation was like the bodger's lathe. You know, the bodger would go into the into the, the tree stand, cut down a tree, take their lathe in, make a, a chair right there and then. And then, you know, the chair would come out. There's no kind of uh, miles. There's no, you know, if it were modern day kind of, you know, trees are cut down in uh lithuania and places like that and then they're shipped into the uk yeah. and they're chopped up and you know lots of energy used all throughout that but the the bodgers would just you know go to the source make the thing there and then i started thinking about there's a company in um, bristol called Modcell who makes straw bale panels for houses and they uh they do the same thing when they're building a house they go in and they get a farmer's barn and build the panels in there and they're they're sort of take take the manufacturing to the the material source or to to the end user um and so i was kind of like just trying to make parallels between the way things used to be made and how we can make things better or more sort of informed um and that's what really spoke to me about your yeah <laughs> your... yeah obviously we've got a massive bottleneck of of a scalability mm. of this so I think that's that's the biggest struggle, but uh, but I think I think the trick is to solve this issue is to you don't necessarily have to scale everything up. You don't necessarily have to increase profits, in, make more, make bigger, yeah. sell and to different regions of the absolutely. world where willow doesn't grow. Right? Yes, Things and like that. and I think that's why it's, it's kind of individual makers, small companies could really fill this kind of void between a massive. Um, a massive multi, you know, national like multi-country overlapping uh, manufacturing and and distribution and everything to to actually I cater for your needs, or I make a small batch of something that is pr truly meaningful, truly uh, made in this way, as you say. And, and I think this is the this is the way to to battle consumerism in a way to. Mm -hmm. I call it, so that was my, funny enough, that was my dissertation about, uh, it's called the craft consumerism. Okay. So it's about um, educating people about how things made, what material used. Um, and so they create a more of an emotional connection to the objects they buy, like a spoon, hand carved wooden spoon. And, and because of that, it's going to be 100% sure it's going to be kept off a landfill because you have this emotional investment into the object or a tool even. Yeah. And you know, when you buy one of these makers' products, like one of my axes, you, you know how it's made, you know where it's made, you can follow the journey through my Instagram or through through all the online social uh, networks and, and you kind of feel like you slightly know the process and it starts in my workshop and by the time it arrives to your door, your story carries on with that object. So yes. your carving becomes a part of your journey. And I think you can't tell that from any you know, kitchen appliances you bought or any of the metal spoons you have in the drawers or, or the shovel you got from B and Q or whatever. Yeah. So so I think this is this is um this is a way of, of truly 
surround yourself with objects and things that are actually meaningful to you and mm-hmm. you will look after it for the rest of your life. And this is the way to to move forward if you want to reduce waste and and wasting things mm. ultimately. So how um how did you go from so you you sort of finished your your mature student university mm. and now you're selling these beautiful axes um and knives sorry yeah didn't mean to didn't mean to forget the knives um just to say we are surrounded about 30 35 yeah, knives yeah in different I don't know stages how i could forget the knives they're all <laughs> they're pointing at upwards yeah. and towards us and away from us and yeah it's very threatening actually um so yeah how did you go did did you sort of know that you wanted to make tools or was it no it's um i never thought i would make tools but um i when i started so the thing is with with to start from a the beginning again uh i had a an incident with my wood during my woodworking career so i worked in a small workshop and come across a really really horrible boss uh it was really mentally physically abusive uh but i was in a really desperate situation I needed the money and i didn't could not afford to leave to find a new job i just kind of got on with it and it just got so bad that i I became depressed. I became also just just never ever sort of self doubt, and it's just I mean the more you doubt yourself, the more mistakes you make on the workshop floor, the more abusive he became. Um, just got to a point that I just didn't want to get up, didn't want to go to work, I didn't want to touch, you know, work with wood ever again. So I quit eventually because me and my wife, as you just said, this can't go on like this. And I um, I just left it all behind. I said I'm never gonna work with wood ever again. And I've gone into education, um, and then during this period, so I was teaching uh, like an unqualified teacher and technician, did some resistant materials and design technology. And during this time, I went to uni uh, and and discovered spoon carving. So I thought, because I have a lot of experience with working with this material, I thought, okay, I'm going to get the best tools on the market. You know, if you, I don't want to waste my time to faff around with cheap quality tools so I, I bought the best one on the market like really really nice super shiny and it arrived uh, and I was very disappointed I was like for my money the amount I spent I expect like top quality you know and again because I knew what I was looking for or what I was working with for me from a critical eye it was like oh this this just not right mm. and I said um, oh I would you know I will keep it a go myself and uh I got in touch with a blacksmith in Hungary, Sabo Andras, and he's forging axe heads. Uh, and then, can we do some prototyping? Can we do something about this? And then that was about, I don't know, seven years ago or something. And from there, it just it was a side hustle, a bit of a hobby I really enjoyed. Making axes, making tools, and just trying to start to understand how they work and what makes them work really well. And then I finished uni, and I started my booming design career, which is, <laughs> which, is uh, which was my, my willow chair went into a few galleries and, and won quite a few awards, which I'm, again, very chuffed with. But um, sadly, we, me and my wife, we had, um, so we li- lived in London at this time, and we had um, mm. three miscarriages one after the other, uh, which, you know, indicated to us that something has to change. Mm. So my wife had a really um, stressful job, so she was teaching at the same school. As I was working and uh, she, she quit so we, we decided that she needed to quit to reduce the stress so if she quit we can't afford to live in London so we have to move out so we moved up to Yorkshire then which we currently still living in and we are in here this lovely workshop in the Yorkshire Yorkshire Dales and uh, and then here I started to to work um, as a furniture designer in a design company but then, the, the, so we moved up 2019 in January. I worked three months at this new place and then the pandemic hit. So the first lockdown came in March. Uh, so they sent me home and say, okay, you know, furlough, which means you stay at home and you get paid. So, sounds amazing. <laughs> uh, not so much for the economy, but um, but for me at the time, it was, it was fantastic. So I built a little shed extension in, in our garden. And I started to do soil creation full time for the first time because so far I just made an axe, I sold it, and I was oh, a bit of pocket money, fantastic. But what, how about if I if I do this a lot and do it more and do it properly? 
Uh, and then once the furlough ended, I went back to the, the design office, which was this horrible cubicle, white room, with three desks, three computers. And I was like, I, I was working in my, in my little shed, making beautiful tools every day, look out, look at the birds, going for a cup of tea with my family, or come into this office, sit down and design really boring chipboard furniture for hotels and and for, you know, all these places. And so I quit the next, next day, which they weren't happy at all, <laughs> you know, being furloughed and then coming back. But but uh, it is, you have to you have to follow follow your dream and follow your calling. If you chicken out because it's inconvenient or this illusion of safety of a job, mm. like there's no such thing as, as a safe job. Like you, if you're not, you're working for your own company, if you're not a shareholder in the way, then you're always replaceable and you always can get rid of you. So it's just an illusion of, of a safe kind of job. Um, so I thought if I work for myself, if I dream, build this dream, then every day I work, I work for my own future, for my own dreams to come become real. So like rather than, you know, pushing further someone else's cart. Um, so yeah, so I quit and I started Soul Creation and that was two and a half years ago. And now we're here in this... Uh, Lovely new workshop. Beautiful workshop. Thank you. I, it's yeah. absolutely stunning. And I am I'm like a little kid in a sweet shop looking <laughs> around at all the tools perfectly in their place. Yeah. It really is a joy. And the, the little stacks of wood. And, oh, yeah. Got a lot of the stacks of wood. Yeah. But that makes it sound like they're disorganized. They are organized. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The yeah, so problem is that my mind is an absolute chaotic place. And... Uh, I have to put order in this somewhere. So um, I probably, I think I suffer quite a bit with the ADHD. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do, I'm like a puppy. Like if I see something, oh, that's a nice piece of wood. And I was middle of doing some leather work. And oh, this is, so I start carving it. And oh, can I make something nice out of it? But uh, luckily, it's the other thing about ADHD that you also can have be hyper-focused. So, which is for me, I turn into a big advantage of if I make a tool or make a, an axe handle or make a, a leather sheath, I'm, nothing else exists. I just focus on it 150%. Uh, and then every stitch has to be perfect. So I'm a bit of a perfectionist, but I manage to use it as a fuel instead of as a hindrance. So for me, it's just aiming to be better than yesterday, to do the best work I possibly can every single time. But I totally forgot what was the question. What was the question? Uh, <laughs> we were talking about ha axes, how you got into oh, yeah. creating. Sorry, I'm just rambling. No, no, on. That's, it's good. <laughs> it's good tangents are, are very much encouraged. Yeah, it's, that's, that's my brain. You know. <laughs> oh, yeah, pieces of wood. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you quit your job. You're here now. I guess, so you make, I would say, high end tools. Yes. Um, People that maybe aren't uh, woodworkers might not, or even aren't green woodworkers, might not know the difference between the very budget axe, like the lowest, yeah. cheapest, most affordable axe, and you know something of your quality. Yeah. And how how are they different? What what do you get? Well, so first you. Again, the price obviously will be a lot higher, as you say, this is a high-end axe. And I think every maker struggles to justify their prices in a way. But um, Especially humble ones like you. Oh, thanks, man. <laughs> every but, time uh, you, your shop sells out, you go, oh, I you know, feel so so relieved or so worried. Yeah, it's well, very it's very sweet. I never, I never take it for granted because, you know, most of us are bloody broke. Mm -hmm. And if someone's spending this much money on an axe and on a knife, I, for me, it means the world. Like, you know, that they, they appreciate my work plenty, that, that enough that they would actually pay for it. But um, what makes it different than from a budget tool is that, first of all, the materials used. So uh, let's say if you talk about an axe, the axe uh, head is hand forged by a really skilled blacksmith. There's two blacksmiths I work with. is James Wood in England, and he... There's absolutely beautiful work. Um, he's a farrier as well, mm -hmm. but he his work is just out of this world. It's, it's really stunning. fantastic. Yeah. yeah, and he's a good good lad. He's a, is he's he? Nice, he's, a, he's, he's all right, isn't he? Yeah, he's a he's a nice guy. 
you catch him on a good day. <laughs> but uh, the other one is in another blacksmith in Hungary. He's um, he's had like forty years of experience, and um, he he's a really skilled craftsman as well. And working with them, these tools are specifically designed to carve wood. First of all, so the what so all this experience I have in woodworking and product design and analytic analytical brain. Uh, I try to understand what makes the tool work really well. And uh, so I designed the axe heads, so the blacksmith forges them, from a hand forging every single one of them. And then I grind the, the edge and I make the handle. So the handle is, I think that one of the things most tools and tool makers I overlook is the handle itself. So this is the part they're actually interacting with your body. So if you... If you sit down on a, on, a, on a chair, on a sofa, if it's not comfortable, you'll be able to tell straight away. Your body will tell you that, oh, it's digs in here, it's not so comfortable, your back is killing you. And it's the same thing applies for tools. So you use a tool in your hand and you're pushing, you, you're straining, you're trying to grip it. Even an axe, you start it, you, you're trying to stop it from um, turning in your hand. So you grip it really hard and you're striking with it. So you want to feel comfortable and confident with the grip force you're using, it's not going to fly out from your hand. So all of these things to to understand this and what makes it work, uh, I put into prototypes and different iterations of these handles. So that's why I gone for a faceted uh, handle design. So it stops the the turning in your hand, which mm -hmm. means if it doesn't turn, you don't have to grip it as hard. But all of these things are uh, uh, subconscious things, so you yeah. don't really think about it because oh, this you you. As you swing in an axe, uh, you feel like it's going to fly out from your hand if you don't grip it hard enough. So you increase the grip, it's going to inflame your, your tendons, and that's why that's one of the reasons I went down this handle design route, because I had a tendinosis in my hand when I started carving spoons. Mm. So I was like, what, how can I make it better that it's, it doesn't happen? As I increase the size of the handle, put facets on it. Uh, so all of, these, all of these things culminated in, into the axe handles I, I designed, um, and make them sort of really high end quality ash, you know, British ash, uh, really nice, you know, grain orientation to make sure that the handle doesn't split. Um, and then moving on to the, the every single little detail, the facets, and then going to the leather sheath as well. Mm -hmm. So they all hand stitched, uh, make sure they all the glue together, they're going to last you for a lifetime. I, I try to make every single tool uh, that will serve you alive for mm -hmm. your life and pass it to your next generation. But if it if it fails in any reason, you know, just send it back to me and I fix it for you, remake it for you. Because as a maker, you only have your reputation as mm -hmm. a, as a as a currency. Nothing else really really matters. And if your reputation is goes down the drain, you, you can never never recover it. And for me, it's just my life mission to make sure that I put out the best work I possibly can. And the only reason I'm charging this much for them because otherwise I can't make a living. Yeah, I mean they obviously take time and effort yes and you know your perfectionism is definitely evident it's thanks man <laughs> yeah um i find it really interesting that whole kind of round handle versus faceted handle yeah so i've um am i gonna say the name i might say it and then bleep it out <laughs> um so, an axe you had previously so so i've got a <laughs> axe yeah which comes with a very smooth handle and yeah. uh, it's not quite round but it's it's quite smooth and I've just replaced it uh, because it snapped and the handle I replaced it with is looking at your work actually I totally stole your design that's okay uh, but it's very sort of chunky facets mm. and it's a little bit bigger yeah. in my hand and it feels I definitely feel like I'm not gripping it so hard. I was getting, yeah. towards the end of last year, I was getting quite bad tennis elbow. Yeah. And that hasn't seemed to come back this year since yeah. changing the axe handle. So yeah, I find it interesting. Did you sort of, is there sort of research into this that you found or was it just sort of... Again, so what I'm doing is, is looking at how it behaves when you use it. Mm -hmm. So... I make an axe handle and I use the axe yeah. extensively. This, oh, it's, it's really hurts my forearm by the end of the day. Like really, 
gosh, it's like, you know, pfft, uh, or my, my wrist hurting or the angle I'm holding it. And I just looking at brutal, being brutally honest. So this is where it comes back to is why, why it does that. And then, so if I put a, a bigger recurve on the handle, the slicing motion of the axis is more exaggerated because that's what we want with carving, carving axes. And um, with the, let's say the, when you hold an axe and there's a palm swell on the end, which is like balancing the axe out and it's stopping it flying out from your hand. So I made the axe hand a little bit thinner there because when you swing an axe really hard, you, you're using a lot of force and you don't want to grip it really hard because then this force kind of dissipates. Mm -hmm. So you want to hold it a little bit looser, but if you want to hold it looser, you want to feel safe, it's not going to fly out of your hand. So I made a bigger palm swell on my axis. So even when you slide your hand down, you, you have a really solid positive grip on the axe. So you can loosen your grip and you swing it full power, no problem. So all of these things, you you just have to look into it and understand why it does the thing it does. And and uh, with most tool makers, let's say if you're a blacksmith and you make axe, axes for a living, you are really skilled blacksmiths. You that's really know your heat, the heat dog, treatment. By the way. Oh, it's not us licking, uh, licking, <laughs> licking water from a bowl, it's the, the dog drinking. <laughs> well, yeah, Jeff got really excited about the, the axes. Yeah. <laughs> just like, just, just dribbling. Me mop, mopping up my bubble. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but I that's tried all right, <laughs> And uh, so they, they, they know the heat treatment, they know how to move, manipulate metal, mm -hmm. but they're not going to have the same experience making a handle or making the leather sheaths for it. So that's what I thought, you know, like back in the days, you, you have these specialized people that they do a certain part, like the budgets, they're going to turn, you know, hundreds of handles, at, um, legs a day. So I, I have specialized in the design and making the handle and making the sheath and make the, if you're making axe heads, forging axe heads, it's a, a profession that you need a lot of experience. So even if I start now, maybe in five, ten years I will be really good at it, but they still gonna have ten years ahead of me. Mm -hmm. Because like, you know, in that ten years they're gonna get better. So I might just get them to do that part and I do the rest. And it's just analyzing things, how they work, how they operate, and being brutally honest and improving the processes to refine it and, and never settling for the design because once you become complacent then there's no space for improvement and mm -hmm. innovation so i'm not saying you know i rediscovered the wheel because it's an axe so a sharp bit of metal on a wooden stick ultimately but but when you pick up well it sounds you say how humble i was but, <laughs> but <laughs> when, you, when you use one of my axes i think you can you can feel start swinging it and and you not necessarily can pinpoint why, but you probably you will feel the difference mm. of how it actually behaves, how you actually in, in how many use it. So I've been using uh, one of your axes recently. Oh yeah. Uh, can I say that it's one that Mike made on a course with you? Oh yeah. Um, so it's not. Oh, he, he made. He did, he did a brilliant job. He made it under your expert guidance. Um, I imagine to, to your sort of style uh, but picking up your axe and sort of my regular axe I noticed that the your axe is actually a little bit lighter mm. uh, but it had a much longer blade and I found like that slice I could get with the longer blade I could do sort of more more cutting with less effort um, and I was surprised at that because yeah. I initially picked up and went, oh, it's a bit light. Yeah. I was, I wanted something heavy. And then, you know, chopping out bowl blanks. It's yeah. Like, oh, this is actually really good. And, and interestingly, like when I do heavier axe heads as well, so heavier axes for these, you know, uh, cutting out bowl blanks, like you don't have to increase the head weight as much. Mm. So I slightly increasing the length of the handle and the, the recurve and you can... You can manipulate these, these because a lighter axe is, is easier to use ultimately mm. for a long time period of time but um but ultimately the small changes of these these parameters like the length of the handle the recurve the cutting edge length you can get a lot you can get away with a lot more so even i do these really small carving axes and they're really light like 600 gram all together and we can get really really good really accurate and remove quite a bit of material with it and uh yeah so it's ultimately that's where it comes down to as long as you understand the principles of what makes that tool work and how mm. it's work and how it behaves within the u usage what you're going to apply for then you can start, start making difference making changes 
and then then you can improve the person's experience with it and and that's why if you ultimately the packs they are fantastic really good for the money you get a really good um, materials good design for the money you're really doing well with it but again you have to make a compromise somewhere so um not sure was that a question no, no. I, was, I was just relating <laughs> an experience yeah and, and you know he, he might did a really good job and and um and you can that's why i say when you pick it up and you can just compare the two together and then it starts to fall into place yeah um when you're designing the shape of the head yeah are you kind of looking at uh historical axes or are you looking at uh just sort of what looks good well or, you know what <laughs> how do you cuz i mean there, i guess there's a a limited amount of shape changes you can really make yeah yeah and it still be an axe yeah again it's not trying to reinvent the wheel because you know if you go go in like I'm gonna make something that nobody else done before mm -hmm. everything been done before yeah so so I went for the bearded axe uh, design so it's like this Viking style as probably most people would know uh, it's been a uh, it's been used quite widely so I think Nick Westermann one of the the guys who has made it quite popular in England so I was very much inspired by his his designs, and uh, but I tweaked it and I I made it my own. That the beard, so the the beard is the the part which is comes down on the axe head. It's really hard to explain without seeing it. But you have the edge of the axe, and they've got a tip on the top, and and they've got a uh, tip on the bottom. And that's if it's curves down, there's a big void behind it. That's the beard, and you can choke up on the axe, which is means that you hold the axe just right underneath the head on the handle uh, and the cutting edge will be right in front of your knuckles and your and your hands so you can do really accurate push cuts with it so you have a lot of control and it has a big up sweep on the tip of the axe which is really good at axing out cranks uh, and the long cutting edge is just really happy this slicing motion so this kind of design is really suits the spoon carving and green woodworking in general it's very versatile um, and you have obviously the traditional scandinavian style Axes, so so there are the most of them look fairly similar, uh, and they do exactly the same thing, but with the small tweaks and making them more specific for the use, what we use it for. Um, you know, like have a timber framer, they're going to have a very different yeah. shaped axe head um, because they do woodworking joints with it, and for us, is is about giving us the flexibility to axe out a certain shape to get into tight curves and corners even. So and being really accurate with it, so having the control. If you if you if you want, you can x out, remove a lot of material with really heavy blows, or get really just push cuts and like shaving. Use it as like a, a you would a chisel or or a, or a, um, a plane. Mm -hmm. So that's that's it's to give this versatility of just a really simple tool that most people imagine it just splitting wood with. That you actually get really accurate carving with it to the line, like to half one mil, and yeah. Look it up. It's really cool. <laughs> I wanted to spin back uh, the idea of you going to a school, a woodworking school. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I've ever, ever heard of that in the in England, in the UK. Well, you used to have uh, technical schools. So you have like like a wood, wood like um, a mechanic shop in the, in the, in the sort grounds. Of, uh, college level, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this one, this one in Hungary, it's a secondary school. Uh -huh. So you go in uh, and you do the four years, and in the end you get your GCSEs. But in the meantime, they allocate depends on how dedicated the school is. Let's say six, seven lessons a week for a specific subject. Mm -hmm. So for us, it would be learning, doing technical drawings, analyzing, like um, recognizing woods, and do workshop and hand jointing. So making all the wood joints uh, by hand. And then as you progress, so year 7, 8, 9, 10, then machinery and all of this. So by the time you get out, you don't get a qualification, but you have a lot of knowledge. And if mm -hmm. you stay for the next like, two years, then you get your qualification as well. Um, but the problem is that it's a really great idea. But in Hungary, the way it works, that it's been... So only pupils go there who are... Who are not being accepted by any other school. Mm -hmm. So, 
let's say not the creme de la creme goes there. So the very low end. Uh, and most of the kids who are there they don't want to be there. They're mm-hmm. only there because they, they have to be in education, but no other college accepted them, so they go there. And which it makes the pupils like I was, who wanted to learn about woodworking. So uh, you did want to be there? Oh, yeah, 100%. You chose yeah. To be there. yeah, I chose it like when I was 10. I was like, I'm going to do this. Uh, I didn't know back then there's other routes for working with wood than being a furniture maker, but that sounded like mm-hmm. a, a solid good idea. And I went there and I, I thought this is going to be a sanctuary or this is going to be a temple of, of knowledge of wood and, and everything, woody, wood, wood. And, uh, but I went there and it just turns out that the teachers couldn't teach because the behavior was so appalling. And um, and the actual the technical, so the actual workshop floor teachers, they just were interested to have pretty much free labor from the pupils. So we were... We were, for two months, we were sending the windows of one of the teachers. Uh, for another three months, we were doing the, I don't know what we were doing, like cabinets for this um, other teacher's daughter, which is, you get some experience on the line, but it's not really about the, you know, the students and having as much knowledge as possible. Mm-hmm. They're just like, oh yeah, it's got a massive workshop available for us, free labor. Keeping busy. Keeping busy. So I was the only one in my class who had better grades in theoretical knowledge of woodworking than practical. Not because I was bad, it's because I wasn't willing to kiss their boot in a way to... I said, like, I'm here to learn. I'm here to learn about machinery and these tools and everything, and I don't want to send a window frame for three months, which is part of the job. I, I'm, you know, I'm not, not overt of um, hard physical labour. but So it was a massive disappointment in, in many fronts. I only find a few teachers who were truly inspiring and truly know what they were doing so there's i learned chip carving in that school so it's like traditional fork um, chip carving in uh, in school rest restoring furniture so I, I was skipping class and i went down to the workshop to restore all the furniture and all this so you things. bunked off class to go and oh yeah do yeah absolutely other like, classes who cares about <laughs> you know, science and everything yeah and so it's an amazing concept and i think this would be a great avenue for for kids who are disengaged from the education academic system, mm. uh, it would be a great alternative. By the time you finish school, you go to the world, you have a qualification, you have quite a bit of experience, uh, and you can, you know, apprenticeship would be great. You can lead into apprenticeship or you can start working under someone already and you have quite a, a good range of knowledge. Uh, but it's, it didn't really work in Hungary um, because I was really disappointed, mm. as I said. Um, and I, after I started work in um, in a workshop, and I was guess what I was sending for three months. And <laughs> if I only was, you'd had a bit more practice. Oh, <laughs> mate. Uh, so I was sending for one pound per hour, which was even in Hungarian standard, it's a terrible, terrible rate. I go buy breakfast, and my half a day wages is gone. So that's when I came to England. I said, you know, I didn't study for six years uh, to do this. So. Again, it's not about sending. I don't have anything against sending. No, but I, I quite enjoy putting the earphones in yeah. and doing a bit of sanding. Yeah, but it's more likely that you start from the bottom. Again, no problem with that. But one pound per hour, it was just, just a joke because they because they could, because you know I was I no actual practical experience in a way, so it can just exploit me. Uh, and I was like, oh, I'm not having this. So I said, I'm going to carve out my own path. Um, you know, find better employment, and I thought you know England would be a good opportunity for this. And uh, yeah, and I did totally different thing <laughs> for the next three years. I never touched a piece of wood. <laughs> the the school was sort of maybe not everything you'd hoped it'd be, mm. but uh, you told me about the the summer camps. Yes. Um, yeah. Would you mind talking a little bit about those? No, no, it's a very... Your very... face is just lit up. Oh, yeah, that's, I was about <laughs> to say that it's, it's just... It's just um, it's a very fond memory of mine because... So so imagine a scenario that in the summer, really nice, crispy, hot, and you either have a few options on what to do in the summer because in Hungary, you, you def- the school finishes in June, like mid-June. So you have two, and, two months, nearly two and a half months. Uh, so what to do with the kids for the parents... So this, they, this camp, sending your kids into a summer camp is a really popular thing. And there are many different ones like English summer camp, you learn English or, or scouts and all these sort of things. But these these ones, these um, craft camps um, that you go in and you with other 30 other kids 
uh, out in the woods in a beautiful campsite for a week and this this Indian camp so not the 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 continent Indians, the Native American camp mm-hmm. Indians uh, and it was just it's just a, a make believe you know like a, a role play in a way but you go in there and you and you pick your Native American name and you kind of identify with this being let's say you always wanted to be this like a romantic idea and then you make yourself headdresses and and you make leather work so we make ourselves like little knives from like any old bits of steel and and a wooden handle but again really basic practical skills and as you say this is what i do now make Mm. make with a bit of metal i make uh, knives and leather work and learn there how the, the fundamentals all of these crafts and go in the woods harvesting your own materials making bows from from hazel and um and every night you know there's like a massive campfire singing and storytelling and in the end uh, you do like um go scouting so pitch dark no or with public lighting you're dressed in black because i oh, mustn't nobody else can spot you mm-hmm. so we need to go and scout out for all the enemy tribes is there any movement and, you know but it's basically it's just for young kids to go out in groups of five and face their own fears Mm-hmm. So you go out, and nothing out there is actually dangerous to you. It's just your own imagination and fears. But you go out there, you you have a mission, uh, and you need to face your own fears, and you need to complete the objectives, like you know, go behind the uh, the stream and you know have a look around and you know report back if you see any suspicious movement. So it's it's all it's all all a game. But but for kids, you know, for a ten, eleven year old kid, this is really serious. And you know, we have like sticks with us if oh, if they see the enemy tribe, we will you know. <laughs> Whatever, but it's so the, the idea was that you need to go out silent and no other scout group can spot you either, so that you fail your mission in a way. And uh, and these things, and the, the leader of this camp was an extremely charismatic guy, he's um, used to work in a uranium mine in, in Hungary, so really rough in a way, but the most charismatic person you ever meet. And uh, he was a wealth of knowledge of all these craft things, and he was he was beautifully understood the human soul and and the soul of the kids you know we went there we were the first generation i think that truly most of our parents were divorced so Mm -hmm. so my mom you know tried to raise three of us on her own and all of us lacked most of us lacked a father figure or a or or a mother so it could be a, a broken families and to have a really charismatic leader who who looked after us who who guided us in a way so i went there since i was nine uh, and to this day, I'm going back every summer, most of the summers. And now I take my own uh, row in there. We just took them last summer uh, and introduced it to this this uh, old bear, his name. And um, yeah, and and it gave us a fundamental of of knowledge of these craft skills, of of being part of a tribe, of of being who you want to be, not rather than who you're pretending to be or who you are pretending in a way that you know when out in society you you put a many masks on a many mm-hmm. different faces and this here you can just be the best version of yourself because the tribe is looking after you it encourages you to be the best you can be and you know it's it's um it's just those of lessons that that you no know, i you know to this day i and my face lit up because to this day, is, I know it's my guiding principles in life, uh, what I learned there and what I experienced there. And I think because of probably in England, it's why it's impossible is the, the health and safety concerns. You know, you can't have, you know, uh, my hands are covered in scars from that period because like, uh, you know, 12 year old kid go in the woods with an axe, like you're going to hurt yourself. But, but, it's, uh, but again, you just, I think, there's a massive opportunity here as well to to kind of pluck out some of these again, just pluck out the things you truly find valuable and trying to apply it. That, that these kids would really, I think, I guess a forest school would be a very good kind of close to it for the kids' experience. But it's it's only just last for a day mm. or two, but being there for a whole week so create really meaningful connections with kids with each other and 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 with the, whoever they're mentoring them, and just truly immerse yourself. And you know, no phones allowed. Just you know, just just unplug, just be be who you want to be. Yeah. So that's that's I think that's was. And again, I went to many other ones. I went like pottery camps, and I went into le- leatherworking one. I went into like scout things as well. So it's a very popular thing in Hungary, mm. and it's a it's a free roaming 
country in a way. So every land that belongs to the government, you can camp there, you can use it, you can do whatever you like in a way as long as you leave it as it were. Uh, and this allows for a lot of these kind of wild camping as well as scout groups and everything to, to be there and exist. It's made you the man you are. Yes, definitely. And all my friends I look around and who I know from there, mm. they are all very, very established people and, and mainly because of that and it's and they, to this day we go back to this guy who used to work in the uranium mine and they just like you know hug him like a father and you know we talk about hundreds of kids yeah because he's been running it for 30 years more than 30 years and you have four or five weeks each summer 30 kids for 30 40 kids each week so he you know, had hundreds of kids that you know enriched their life so i think that's something to aspire to <laughs> Thank you, Peter. What an absolute legend. You can head to Soulwood Creations. I've put a link in the show notes uh, to Peter's website and to Peter's Instagram. Uh, Head on over and have a look at the wonderful tools he makes. Really, really beautiful things. Uh, Get yourself on his email list or in his Instagram if you want one, because they do sell out quick when he puts them online. Uh, Also a link to the Heritage Craft Red List. Make sure you go and check that out. Maybe pick a new hobby. What else to say? Sussex Trugs, link to that. James Wood, maker of things. Uh, He is one of the blacksmiths that Peter uses. Um, Very, very lovely work. Uh, Put a link to his Instagram as well. Uh, Nick Westerman, who um, is an incredible tool maker. Definitely worth checking out his work. Get on his enormous waiting list. Uh, they are the carving tools that I use predominantly. Uh, yeah, definitely worth getting on the waiting list for some of those. Um, and also to a link to some chip carving stuff, which is a decorative uh, technique where you remove little uh, pieces of wood, uh, little chips of wood, um, into sort of uh, tessellating patterns. Um, so yeah, have a look at those. Um, I mentioned in there the talk I did for NUCAN, which is the um, Climate Action Network. Uh, I didn't record it. Uh, I did put quite a lot of effort into pulling it all together. So I did think that I will try and record it and I'll stick it on YouTube or something uh, in case you're interested. It sort of ties together my history of building but also with the the things I've sort of pulled in. Um, So that includes sort of heritage crafts and things like that. Um, And sort of my ethos in terms of building. So uh, look out for that. I'll probably stick that online for the 100th episode. That's the next episode. Brilliant. Yes, as I mentioned at the beginning, Patreon, patreon.com forward slash building sustainability. There is bonus content from this chat. Uh, with Peter talking about uh, organising his workshop. And I think that's it. Uh, I guess just time to say thank you so much for listening. Uh, Thank you so much for everyone who's been so patient in the long gap between podcasts. Yeah, I look forward to um, sharing another chat with you uh, very soon. All the best. Bye-bye.